I just wanted to know what, closer, why, did, yeah, why did God put the tree in the garden to begin with? He ultimately knew what decision Adam and Eve would make. So why even put the tree there to begin with? Because it makes it just seem like we're just a big social experiment. Uh, uh, let me give, give a shot at it first. Uh, great question. Um, if you understand, if you look at what the, the nature of God first, that's what I go to, the nature of God first. And from a Christian perspective, God is a community. There is one God who is one being, but three in his personhoods, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, eternally distinct personhoods who share one nature. Is that easy to, gr to grasp? No. Is it, is it comprehensible uh, by finite human beings? No, but it doesn't go against our logic. So God exists in the Christian mindset as a community. He defines what love and relationship is. He eternally exists in a state of relationship. So you as an effect, he's the cause, but you as an effect actually crave, desire, want, covet, and mourn the loss of relationship. It's one of the key things about human existence. And you're the effect. Shouldn't the cause reflect something about that? And in this case, in the Christian worldview, the cause, who is a triune being who exists in relationship, actually explains why you, the effect, want it so badly. Now, how does that relate to your question on the Garden of Eden? God himself is a relational being. And in order to have true relationship, instead of a wind-you-up automaton like the monkeys who clasp like this and the eyes bug out and all these things, where we just wind up and see where we go, he creates the ability for us to have a choice, an actual freedom to choose relationship. Because relationship not chosen is not really relationship at all. But relationship chosen is real. Love actually has an existence then in a real sense because love itself is vulnerable. So he creates this scenario where people can actually choose. The choice is freely given. God's foreknowledge does not necessarily mean he creates, the, he creates the choice that they make, but the possibility for them to make that choice. He does it so that we can have relationship. You see, the God of the Bible does not lack relationship. He never lacks it. He eternally exists in that state. So why create us? He doesn't need us for relationship. Why create you or create me to muck it up? He creates you and creates me not so that he can have relationship. He's already got it within himself in the Godhead. He creates you and creates me so that you can. It is an utterly selfless act in that sense. He utterly and selflessly creates out of an abundance of his love, out of abundance of who he is as a relational being, and that relationship requires choice and a free will that's there. And that tree allows for that. And because of that, you and I, have, there, there's, a, there's a fallen nature to human humanity, and that's there as well. But then the redemption comes in, and then we are offered, as Ravi had already said from John 3.16, that God so loved, relational quality, the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe, and actually given, and actually chosen, shall not perish, but have everlasting life. From the beginning we have relationship, from eternity we have relationship, and in redemption we have relationship. And the tree actually is the, is the beginning of that. <clears throat> It's a very, very good question, sir. And I think it actually hinges a little bit also on the previous one. You know, the thing about skeptics sometimes when they ask us these questions, and I'm not saying it's you because I don't know the background from which you're coming, is oftentimes I wonder whether they realize we ask these same questions. You know, we struggle with these issues. It's not like we think these are invalid questions. They are very valid questions. But what does the question assume? The question assumes something very critical, that the answer should be coherent. Because a coherent worldview is what you're really looking for. You cannot be comfortable with incoherence. And the question that was asked earlier, the whole issue of how does one talk to a Stephen Hawking. The fascinating thing about the talk that Stephen Hawking gave in 1990 at the Lady Mitchell Auditorium, which was packed, on the question of is man determined or is he free? He went through about 25 minutes of all kinds of scientific arguments and so on, and his culminating statement got an audible response of, oh my, is this the best answer we can get? And what he said at the end is, yes, we are determined. He was under the stranglehold of determinism right from the beginning in a, in a, in a naturalistic framework. He said, yes, we are determined, but since we do not know what is determined, we may as well not be. That was his concluding statement. 
Yes, we are determined, but since we don't know what is determined, we may as well not be. What he's really saying is, since we don't know the answer to my, the explanation for my conclusion, let us live as if it is not a legitimate conclusion. That's really what he was saying. So I say, when you're looking for a coherent worldview, look at it this way. What options would there have been for the great creator in the beginning of this? No world at all versus this world. Okay. Number two, creating a world where there would be no such thing as good or evil, an amoral world. Number three, choosing a world where we would only choose good, where we'd be predetermined to choose good, that would be the total constraint. So we've got three options, nothing versus what we now have, no such thing as good or evil, or creating a constraint where we would only choose good and there were, we would never make the evil choice. Or number four, creating this kind of world where there would be the possibility of good and evil and we are given the option of the privilege of freedom and making the choice. Out of these four options, this option is the only universe and the only world in which love is possible. In the previous three, love is not possible at all. Love would not have been possible within, between the divine and human uh, uh, interaction. So I say this, sometimes these are uh, mega questions and macro questions, and other times they are filtered down into micro questions and the fine tuning of an individual life. I found the answer to this, first of all, from the negative. You take a naturalistic framework, you live with an incoherent world. I couldn't live with that. So how do I find coherence? In putting together the diversity in my own heart, which was put together by God. And that knowledge of a personal relationship with God, which changed not only what I did, but what I wanted to do in my personal life, gave me hope, meaning, and a relationship. Let me give you just two quick illustrations, because I think this is critical. I've had the opportunity of speaking at the, one of the most famous prisons in the world, Angola Prison in Louisiana. Abdu was with me, some of my colleagues with me. 6,000 plus prisoners there, 85% of whom are in life without parole. It was the bloodiest prison in America. Blood on the ceilings, blood on the carpets, blood on the walls. When a prisoner was checked in there, he was given a dagger or a knife with which to protect himself. And this warden comes in, this director comes in and says, I'm going to change this place. You allow me to do it my way. He put a Bible in every cell. He had chapel every day. He has a seminary that he's built in there. Within a matter of a year or two, it became the safest prison in America. Today, instead of a gang of thugs, they've got gangs of pastors going through that prison out there. And they're the prisoners themselves. We had lunch with them. And I said to the guy sitting opposite us, why don't you and get yours? He said, hey man, I'm going nowhere. You may as well go and get yours and then I'll join you. The guy who led in worship, a young man, I said to him, can I ask you a question? Because led worship so beautifully. He said, I said, can I ask you a question? Are you here for life without parole? He said, yes, sir. I said, how do you feel? He said, Mrs. Zacharias, if you'd known why I am here, you would never ask me that question. He said, but let me tell you something. Out there, I thought I was free, and the horrific things that I did destroyed people's lives and destroyed my own. Now, inside prison bars, having found Christ, I have never been freer in my life. This is the most free I have ever been. Pray for my family. They're outside and think they are free when they are really not. And he put his arm around me and prayed for me. And there were tears running down my face. We had lunch made by the prisoners. The warden sits there, eats the lunch that the prisoners have made. Boy, you call that faith? You better believe it. <laughs> and he does it. Why? They have found meaning by an individual life being conquered. When you know Christ, when you have that relationship, and your will is transformed to his will, you find out why you were made in the first place. And the crowd is just multiplied opportunity for individual conquest that God desires in every life out here tonight. I'll leave that with you. Let me hear you. Jehovah. Jehovah. Jehovah.